Well, good morning, everyone. I can certainly feel the energy in the room. Je me déplace cette occasion pour vous remercier pour l'accueil chaleureux ainsi que pour l'invitation. I would also like to take a moment to thank Elder Skeins for his opening prayer and blessing. I really can't think of a better way to start your conference and to start our day. I would also like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. And first and foremost, I also want to take this opportunity to thank the Canadian Association for Community Health Centres for inviting me here today. I really have to say, I always feel at home when I'm surrounded by healthcare professionals, and thank you for the work that you do day in and day out. Canada's community health centre are leaders in every sense of the term. You are on the front line, caring for Canadians each and every day, and I can't thank you enough for the service that you do. Putting the Declaration of Astana into action is not an easy task. Translating words into action never is. And I'm a politician, so I'm pretty familiar with that. Let's start by taking a step back. Forty years ago, the world gathered in Alma-Ata, then part of the Soviet Union. The Alma-Ata Declaration made a commitment to health for all. The primary care was at the heart of it. For decades on, we have made great strides towards keeping this promise. And Canada is certainly at the forefront. This is because our commitment to primary care, which began long before Alma-Ada. Last week was the 100th anniversary of Canada's first Department of Health, so it's particularly relevant. When it comes to primary care, the federal government doesn't typically offer direct services. Rather, we play a leadership role that has evolved over time. For the first 50 years of Confederation, Health was officially handled by the Department of Agriculture. And yes, I said agriculture, to my surprise. In reality, the government did little. It was the 20th century's climate of social, social change that spurred the government to set up a dedicated health department in 1919. Yet, the era of progressivism, followed by the Second World War, was truly transformed that truly transformed our place in primary care. Canadians reimagined the role of government in their lives, and they wanted their government to do more. First, this caused the creation of the new Department of National Health and Welfare in 1944, under the leadership of Brooke Claxton, whose name now adorns our building. Secondly, led by the great Tommy Douglas, Saskatchewan introduced Canada's first ever hospital insurance program followed by universal medical coverage in 1962. Both moves spurred the federal government to act, first with health grant programs, and then, after a long political battle, the Medical Care Act. When introducing it to Parliament in 1966, my predecessor, Alan J. McEachern, proclaimed the words that have become the hallmark of our system today, and I quote, all Canadians should be able to obtain health services of high quality according to their need and irrespective of their ability to pay." End quote. And then Medicare was born. This followed in 1984 by the Canada Health Act, guaranteeing a national standard of primary care to every Canadian regardless of where they live. Today, Canada's health care system is a symbol of national identity reflecting the values we hold dear, fairness, compassion, and support for one another. Yet, there are many enduring challenges we still grapple with. We're also confronted by an array of new ones. Things have changed immensely since Elma Ada, including Elma Ada itself, which is now known as Almaty, Kazakhstan. On October dernier, Les gouvernements de partout dans le monde ont renouvelé leur engagement à l'égard des soins de santé primaires en tant qu'aspect essentiel pour garantir l'universalité de tous les soins. Il s'agit d'un point particulièrement important dans le contexte du programme de développement durable à l'horizon 2030. Des systèmes de soins de santé primaires solides aideront à faire des objectifs de développement durable une réalité. Le système de santé assurant la prestation de soins de santé primaire solide sont plus susceptibles de fournir des soins équitables, efficaces et adaptés. Cette vision renouvelée de soins de santé primaire connaît un essor considérable. 
La concrétisation de cette vision est essentielle à l'atteinte de l'ambitieux triple milliard à l'horizon 2023 à l'Organisation mondiale de la santé, à savoir un milliard de personnes supplémentaires bénéficiant de la couverture sanitaire universelle, un milliard de personnes supplémentaires mieux protégées face aux situations d'urgence sanitaire et finalement un milliard de personnes supplémentaires bénéficiant de meilleurs états de santé. So, what does this mean for Canada, for Canada or Canadians? We all know Canadians are proud of their publicly funded health care system. It's almost a cliché at this point, as anyone who spent any time in the United States. And this actually, we've been reminded by this when we're watching the Raptors at the NBA Finals, when Cohen O'Brien tweeted, win or lose, at least the Toronto Raptors know they have health care. But just because we have a sturdy vessel doesn't mean we don't face rough seas, and we acknowledge that. For one, not all Canadians, as indicated earlier, have equal uh, health care coverage. Indigenous peoples, seniors, new Canadians, and others are confronted by unique challenges and impact of many chronic diseases are quite disproportionate. Even more so, there are storm clouds on the horizon. And that's why we're acting now to ensure that our system remains a point of pride for Canadians long into the future. In particular, Canadians told us that two things had been underfunded for far too long, and that was in the area of mental health and home care. So we've put our money where our mouth is with the largest investment in Canadian history in home care and mental health, an unprecedented $11 billion from budget 2017. Now, of course, mental health and home care aren't primary care themselves. That's exactly the point. Now, allow me to elaborate on how two provinces, that being British Columbia and Saskatchewan, illustrate how these investments help primary care. British Columbia, for example, is using home care funds in four areas, including scaling up successful models and connecting them to primary care and improving home care infrastructure and technology. What does this look like, you might ask? It's a personal support worker who used to come to a home once a week caring for a senior every day, or a patient's health information being collected at home and sent directly to their doctor. What's the upshot? Well, it's fewer visits to the hospital, freeing up valuable space. It's, nur it's, it's nurses spending less time doing clerical work and more time caring for their patients and it's a better use of primary care to focus resources on those who need them the most. We also must integrate existing services. BC's primary care network coordinate across the healthcare sector to identify and assist those most at risk, while Saskatchewan's community health centers are hubs for teams that integrate primary care, urgent chronic care, and home visits for seniors. And finally, we can expand the role of those who provide primary care. Saskatchewan supports a great program that helps doctors diagnose and treat mental health conditions in young people, while BC assists primary care providers in caring for those assist, uh, affected by the opioid crisis. Yet, this isn't all. I sit at a cabinet table where nearly every decision considers the social determinants of health. We began by establishing a Canadian Council on Social Determinants of Health, a group of leaders across an array of sectors. We know that things like housing, education, employment have a huge impact on health, and we're acting. To ensure that every Canadian has a place to call home, we launched Canada's first ever national housing strategy, supported by $55 billion in federal funding. To help every kid get the best chance in life and the best start at life, we're putting money in pockets of the parents through the Canada Child Benefit. And with these investments, we've already lifted over 300,000 children out of poverty. And to prepare Canadian workers for the jobs of tomorrow, we're investing in heavily, in, in heavily in skills and training, including the new Canada Workers Benefit. Le Canada ne fait pas que s'attaquer aux enjeux liés aux soins de santé à l'intérieur de ses propres frontières 
Il appuie les actions menées pour améliorer la santé des gens partout autour du monde entier. Le gouvernement maintient son engagement à croître les efforts déployés à l'échelle mondiale pour parvenir à la couverture sanitaire universelle, pour convaincre l'importance des soins de santé primaires et pour prôner l'équité en tant que principes fondamentaux dans le domaine de la santé. Pour nous, les soins de santé primaires doivent être le reflet de progrès sociaux qui ont été réalisés au cours des 40 dernières années qui se sont écoulées depuis Alma-Ata. Il faut, entre autres, reconnaître que les systèmes de santé, les soins de santé primaires, doivent tenir compte de la spécificité des sexes. In conclusion, en conclusion, I am wide-eyed about the challenges that we all face. They are diverse just as they are complex. They reach across borders and across all sectors. Yet, I know that we have what it takes to tackle them right on and head on. And that's why that I'm here today with leaders from community health centers across Canada. You are the future of primary care. Dynamic, diverse, rooted in, com in community, and compassionate to all. As the backbone of our system, I can't think of a better place than here to start a new conversation about primary care. While our challenges are great, I know that we have what it takes to master them. How do I know that? Think back 100 years ago this month when our Department of Health was in its infancy. Diseases like smallpox, pol polio, wreaked havoc, terrorizing the world and claiming millions of lives. Today, thanks to our efforts, these killers have been relegated to the pages of history. 100 years from now, when we discuss the challenges of 2019, I hope that we can say the same. Once again, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me today, and I wish you all a very productive and inspiring conference. Merci à tous.